I stayed in a rooming house in Prague. The Gestapo entered several times and you could hear them talk, taking several occupants away. One could only listen to the drama and live in fear for the next night. Today marks Holocaust Memorial Day 2022. This Memorial Day is held across the world each year on the 27th of January. It's a global effort to remember the six million Jews murdered during what we now call the Holocaust and also those murdered in subsequent genocides in Cambodia, Rwanda, Bosnia and Darfur. This annual event serves as a stark reminder to all of us of the result of the evils of discrimination and prejudice if left unchecked and unchallenged. Genocide does not come out of nowhere. We should all be aware that the most savage barbaric acts of evil in history didn't start with the concentration camp, but with graffiti on the shop front of a Jewish business, with the shout of abuse in the street, with a brick through a window and with the forced separation of people. It's a process that begins with prejudice and discrimination. It begins with the idea that some people are worth more or worth less than others. When looking back on the Holocaust and more recent atrocities, the questions must be asked. How could man have such utter contempt for man? Why science that can heal was used to kill? Why education which can enlighten was used to rationalise away basic moral impulses? Why bureaucracy, that sustains modern life, was used as the machinery of mass death in a ruthless, chillingly efficient system where many were responsible for the killing, but few got blood on their hands. My name is Henry William Coner, known as Billy Coner to my friends, and I was born just after the war to parents who fled Bohemia in Czechoslovakia and found refuge here in Northern Ireland initially on the refugee farm at Milal. That safe haven was set up by a committee from the Jewish community in Belfast and received many children from the kinder transport. Children aged from three months to 17 years who came alone without parents or loved ones. The trust, respect, help and kindness my parents received from all the people of Malayal and elsewhere in Northern Ireland helped them rebuild their lives and their futures. Being able to come to Northern Ireland with their two very young daughters, being accepted here and given opportunities was a huge gift and for that they were and I will be forever grateful. Let me fill in a little more detail. Hitler came to power in Germany in 1933. Through a series of restrictive laws and by savage propaganda, they stirred up hatred of non-Aryan, basically Jewish people in Germany and the territories they later absorbed, such as Austria and Czechoslovakia. In particular, the laws passed in 1935, just a year after my parents married, made the life very difficult for anyone of Jewish origin, not just by religion. Progressively, Jews were excluded from many ordinary activities and eventually from participating in economic, cultural and social life. My father's parents lived in Podersam, a small town of about 7,000 people west of Prague, where they had the town's main general clothing and household linen shop. And my mother's parents lived in another bigger town, more to the north, where her father was a linen import and export trader. My own father, Franz Kohner, was a prominent country lawyer with a thriving office in a town not far from his parents. The position of Jews in Germany dramatically worsened after Kristallnacht, a night of rioting and destruction focused on Jewish premises and orchestrated by the Nazi government. Jewish businesses were destroyed and many synagogues were burned down. That was a huge danger signal to Jews all over Europe. 
In September 1938, Germany annexed the Sudetenland following the Munich Agreement and a terrible occupation began. Escape from Czechoslovakia became imperative for my parents and for all other Jews. My father writes in his memoirs, the moment of truth arrived for us one night when an anonymous caller phoned and told us to clear out without delay. So the next morning, I took my wife, children, and the most necessary clothing and bedding in my car to my wife's grandparents in the country. I recall the Nazis did terrible things to the Jews who stayed behind. I recall them forcing Dr. Korolek, our GP, to scrub the whole town square on his hands and knees. I also had to wrench my father from his home, his beloved garden and his business in Potosam, and take them to a small bedroom I had rented in a house in Prague. It was like carrying off a king into exile. I stayed in a rooming house in Prague the Gestapo entered several times and you could hear them talk, taking several occupants away. One could only listen to the drama and live in fear for the next night. It was not easy for them. Not only did they have to flee their home to Prague, moving several times in a few months, but all their time and effort was put into getting a visa to exit occupied Czechoslovakia. And then to also get a visa into any country that would accept them. Obtaining the Nazi exit visa required documents to show that one had paid all taxes, library fines, had proof of no convictions, and many other conditions. An entry visa to another country required other conditions, which were often impossible to satisfy. Finally, in possession of the Nazi swastika passport stamp, for permitted exit, and the British entry visa for them and their two daughters, aged three and two. They left Prague in mid-August 1939, but many family members were not so lucky. Of my mother's aunts, uncles and cousins, 17 were killed by the Nazis. My mother's parents had fortunately got out to America, but my father's mother, my grandmother, was deported to the Terezin concentration camp for a horrifying last three years of her life and then in 1942 onto Auschwitz and so be born death camp where she was killed. Her husband, my grandfather, died of injuries in 1939 and my father's sister also died tragically. The loss of his mother this way was an eternal shadow over my father and the whole family. I never knew these grandparents and I only saw my maternal grandparents twice when I was very, very small. Arriving in Northern Ireland was a blessing. I could have been raised in Canada or America or Palestine or even, uh, which later became Israel, or even Tahiti, which was a possibility, but not a real one, if those visa applications had only succeeded. But it was Britain that had decided to admit 10,000 children alone without their parents. This was known as the kinder transport and was the reason my parents could come. In Belfast, the Jewish community got a committee together including Barney Hurwitz, Mandy and Alec Burwitz, Leo Skop, Morris Solomon and others, doing everything they could to provide a base for these refugees. As well as pledging £50 per child to the government, quite a sum in those days, as proof of subsistence, they took a lease on an old rundown farm at Ballyrolly in Belisle. They brought over also as a refugee from Vienna an experienced farming manager to run the agricultural side. And through linen connections of my maternal grandfather, who traded with Northern Ireland linen businesses, my father was brought in as the administrative manager. He and my mother were practicing Jews, though not Orthodox, and between them they spoke about five or six languages. 
My father had been a prominent and experienced youth leader and his law background gave him further qualification. The Malal job ensured his visa and coming to Northern Ireland saved their lives. On arriving there was much work to do. The buildings were old and run down. There were insufficient buildings for all the children and other refugees who came, so early living space for them was intense. My father's, my parents' first home was a cow bar, cleaned out and with a curtain to separate bedroom from living room, a simple table and orange boxes for chairs were the first furniture. But it was home and it was safe and it was in a free country. As so-called enemy aliens, they had to register with the police weekly. They had to get a permit to travel up to Bangor, Donoghadee or Belfast. And they were soon befriended by many in the local community. They received such kindness and generosity and true friendship that came to them as a wonderful surprise. The police inspector, Bill Moffat, in charge of so-called enemy alien refugees with whom my dad had to register, became such a close and lifelong friend that my dad called me William or Billy after him, unaware that this was a sort of tag in Northern Ireland. Henry after the grandfather I never knew and Billy after Inspector Bill Moffat. On first meeting with Inspector Moffat, my mother writes in her diary, we went to his head office in Chichester Street to register on August the 8th, 1939, with a feeling of trepidation. The very word police sent shivers down our spine from our Gestapo experiences. But we found a tall, relaxed man behind a desk who later told Francie that he was bemused by my husband's tension. He even invited Francie for a glass of Guinness, the final symbolic confirmation of acceptance in a new land. The farm flourished and over the war years, some of the refugees started to move away. The teenagers of the kinder transport were growing older and some found jobs. Some moved to university. All came with little or no English, but all learned. My mother spoke English as well as Czech, German and French, but my father, who spoke no English on arrival, read every shop sign, every poster and every newspaper he could get his hands on until he became fluent. My family left the farm in 1943 and my dad got a job in retail and then went on with my mother to fund a clothing manufacturing firm that I took over age 23 when he was too infirm to carry on. Following a total loss fire in the troubles of 1969, we moved the business to Newton Abbey, where it employed up to 180 people. Considering that there were probably about 100 refugees at the farm in Malisle, it is amazing that apart from one other person, our family was the only one to remain in Northern Ireland. For us, it is a home, a wonderful home. And my sister Ruth, now 84, but two when she arrived, still lives in Belfast. We both cherish the opportunity that we have been given by the Malal Refugee Farm and the wonderful environment of Northern Ireland. The heritage of the Holocaust now moves on to the subsequent generations. There are few who escaped and came as anything older than toddlers who are still alive and able to bear witness. So it is the next generation who now do this. The impact of the Holocaust, the inherited trauma, the many unspoken horrors are not easily cast aside. Even in my children's generation, there is a will to do something positive for the world. One of my daughters works in human rights in a wide European context from her base in Brussels. 
and another develops art pro arts projects for minority groups and asylum seekers in Glasgow. Before I stop, I would like to offer some statistical comparisons to reflect the immensity of the organized killing that was the Holocaust. It is an accepted fact that over six million European Jews, gypsies and other minority people were systematically killed by the Nazis. That figure is roughly equivalent to the entire population of the whole island of Ireland. And for every one of the 10,000 children who fortunately came to Britain in the transport, for every one, there were 100 children who did not and who were killed. So why is it important to remember the Holocaust on the 27th of January each year? Why do we bear witness to the terrible tragedies of the past? Each of us have our own answers to this. But to me, there are four reasons. First, it is to honor the memory of the millions who were mercilessly and systematically killed by the Nazi regime. We should not forget them. Secondly, it reminds us that there are places in the world where terrible wars and genocides are happening now. We must protest against that happening in an effort to stop it. Thirdly, particularly pertinent to Northern Ireland, we should remember how the pogroms and Kristallnacht leading up to the Holocaust enabled ordinary citizens to be whipped up into inexplicable hatred of other groups in their society. And fourthly, it reminds us that we must make an effort to be kind, tolerant and helpful to those in our midst of different colour, creed, origin, who are otherwise different from us. We should rejoice in difference rather than mistrust it. Genocide is still happening around the world today and it's up to all of us to stand up against any form of intolerance, be it discrimination, racism, anti-Semitism, homophobia, xenophobia, sexism and more, and to try to make the world a safer place for everyone. To quote the words of a Holocaust survivor and Nobel Peace Prize winner L.A. Wiesel, there may be times when we are powerless to prevent injustice, but there must never be a time when we fail to protest. The theme for Holocaust Memorial Day this year is one day. One day where we remember those who were abused or murdered and those who suffered through genocide. One day when we reflect and come together as a community to build a better future. One day where we learn from the past so that the horrors of genocide aren't repeated. So that together we can create one day in the future without discrimination, without hatred and without genocide. Antrim and Newton Abbey Borough Council is committed to remembering the Holocaust. We vow to remember the victims of the Holocaust and other genocides throughout the world, both past and present. We remember the lives lost, families devastated, and the communities destroyed. We also value the sacrifices of those who have risked their lives to stand up against genocide, for they have shown an overwhelming human capacity for good in the face of evil. It's my privilege today to lead this Memorial Day commemoration to honour the victims of the Holocaust. Let us all act today and affirm our commitment to create a peaceful society where diversity is embraced and celebrated.